chance that he had. Kimball Anders, touchdown! Kimball Anders, touchdown team. Second touchdown for Kimball Anders. Kimball Anders finding running room. It's a race. Ray Bly chasing him. And two Rams finally bring him down. Job is the main man, but he's no rookie to football. Former Kansas City Chief Kimball Anders is now Coach Anders. Northeast High School is rich with tradition, but the past several years have been brutal. But one man is ready to use his experience to bring back the glory days. Coach Kimball Anders has been on the job just three weeks, but is already making an impact. I have a good group of kids. That's one thing I'm very excited about. Anders is our Greater Houston Honda Dealers Coach of the Week. Now in his third season as the head coach of Galveston Ball, it's been a happy homecoming to say the least for Ball alum Kimball Anders. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to National Scouting Service Podcast Show. I am um, Coach O, and we have a very, very interesting show um, for you all tonight kind of little um, education on the background of Kimball Anders. He's been doing a lot of podcast shows, and I thought I just wanted to bring something different and telling about his life from where, he from where he's from, how he was brought up through high school, college, on to his professional career, and on his way into the Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame. I am Coach O. You can follow me on Twitter at Coach O, also on Twitter at National Scouting, and you can follow us on Station Head at National Scouting Service as well. This show is being brought to you and being sponsored by Ink to the T. You can find Ink to the T on Instagram. Also being sponsored by Uncontested Hoops. That is Coach Herb Washington. You can follow him on Uncontested Hoops if you're someone that's interested in ball skill training, ball handling, shooting, as well as the mentality of playing um, basketball. This show has also been um, sponsored by um, Running Back, Giving Back, which is Kimball Anders Foundation, and by Black Love and Marriage Our Way. You can follow Black Love and Marriage Our Way on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, as well as on YouTube. They will have a show going um, live tonight on um, YouTube, so be sure to tune in to that. That would be at 8 o'clock um, p.m. Central Standard Time, and this show is being broadcasted by YouTube, National Scouting Service, Facebook, National Scouting Service, and you can listen to it on our podcast radio station under Station Head. You will have to download the Station Head app and tune in to National Scouting on that. Um, with that being said, you cannot give a big introduction or a small introduction for this individual. I'm glad that I'm having the opportunity, opportunity to be able to um, introduce him, interview him, and with that being said, we're going to bring him in shortly, but just a little about him. I'm proud to introduce a son, a brother, a father, a uncle, a grandfather, educator, mentor, coach, and soon to be Hall of Famer and our special guest, Mr. Kimball Anders, who will be on just in one second. How you doing, Mr. Anders? And I'm glad you can come on to our show. Great to be here today. Well, we're glad to have you on as a guest, man. And this is a big honor for me. You know, I'm someone who always looked up to you. Um, also was was raised by this individual. Um, and I don't, I don't, man, I don't even have the words. I know we talk all the time. I'm nervous as heck being on this show, but it's different when you have somebody on the platform on your show because you want to make sure you're doing everything right, especially for a person who's going into the Hall of Fame. So I'm a little shaken up and a little nervous right now, so you'll have to excuse me. But before we do that, this is Mr. Kimball Anders, uh, a former NFL player, three-time yeah. pro bowler, and soon to be uh, Kansas City Chief Hall of Famer. But I want to break the ice a little bit before we go in. The key number to this show tonight okay. is 38. The reason being, that's Mr. Kimball Anders' yes, sir. football number. And with that being said, I, I've heard and I know that you are a very generous person. So I got to go ahead and throw it out there before we start the show. Can I get thirty eight thousand dollars? Thirty eight. I give you thirty eight cents. 
I got 30 cents for you. Good. <laughs> hey, 30 cents yep, a long yeah, way. Does, now. Hey, I, I had to throw that out there, man. So, you know, he is generous, but that was his way of saying no. So I guess we're not going to um, get that. I guess I'm not going to receive that. But, <laughs> hey, man, you know, I'm glad to have you on the show. We're going to get um, started. And one of my things I want to start off with to break the ice as well is some things that people may have not known about Mr. Kimball Anderson. Now, I didn't ask him any of these things, so it's going to be a shock for him, some of these questions I'm going to ask. But yeah, yeah. as a youth, you played in the Ray yes. T. Shepard Youth Baseball League. Oh, absolutely. What team did you play I was, for? I was uh, the Green Machine. No, no, the uh, GL team. What GL team was? The, the Braves, man. Against the Green Machine. The Braves. The All Braves. right. Yeah. Play for the Braves. Yeah. Now, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Jill was one of the best coaches out there. And we played against the Green Machine when they had skinny head. They had all these great players. They was loaded. And it was like a, a big rival every week. And uh, truth be told, I was a pretty good little baseball player as well. You know, I, actually, I'm in the, in the Hall of Fame for the, for the I, Little League. See, you ruined that. I was, a, I was about to I was about. I knew to that already. I yeah. knew that already. But, so Kimball but, Anders but it, did play it, baseball. So, you know, he's an yeah, all-around oh. athlete, and he's all also around. in the Ray T. Shepard Hall of Fame. So congratulations to, to you with that as well. Also, you. Um, you grew up playing um, sports in, in Rock County as well as the um, Galveston Boys Club, which is the Galveston Boys and Girls Club now. Kimball yeah. is also a ping pong champion as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> we, I think we was about 12 years old at the time. We went to me way to Mexico to play in a tournament up there, and I won a championship for the Boys and Girls Club in Mexico as a ping pong table tennis champion, and I still got game to this day. And I was about, so I was I about to ask you that. I, I, I don't play as much. Hey, because you know it, it, it's, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a couple of people out there. They're gonna question yeah. that. They're gonna challenge you when they see you. They're gonna be asking when you're ready to play. So you better you better get ready. You better get ready for that. I got a, I got a little left. I mean, I, matter of fact, a couple of years ago we went. We was in coaching a few years ago. When we still at the high school. Uh, mm -hmm. I took somebody over there and beat them up up one time over there. I forgot one of the coaches. I forgot who it was. I All took right. them up and beat them over there. So okay. definitely still got a little game. Okay, another thing that some people may not know, you have a tennis shoe fetish. Love tennis shoes, correct? Correct. All right. Now, best. <laughs> now, now, believe it or not, to the people that to the people that's listening, when Mr. Anders was playing professionally, he used to buy two pair of every pair of shoes that he would wear. Yes. So if they was Nike Air Max, he'll get two pair. What was the reason behind that? Well, so the truth be told, kind of growing up, right? Now, in our era, we had tennis shoes that was under $25, $50, you know? So we had to actually, in my household, we had to get the hand-me-down shoes from whether it was an uncle, whether it was my big brother. So we, we weren't able to afford those tennis shoes at that time, even though the shoes at that time were just Converse. Uh, Nike wasn't even a big thing at the time, but uh, Wiener shoe, whatever they may be. Just uh, having a, the, the, the opportunity of not having back then. So once I got an opportunity to buy those type of things and be able to, you know, because that was my biggest thing, loving tennis shoes, even when I was a kid. And I always want to keep my, my shoes clean, fresh, new looking, even to this day. I don't like to get scuffs on there. I would probably <laughs> take my shoe off right now and clean it before I even come on, uh, come on air right now just to make sure that, you know, because it's just for me, really. But I always wanted to have that appearance of just being clean. Okay. Especially on your feet. Your feet was the most one of the most important things. Matter of fact, I know when we was growing up, my grandma used to say, you have a clean haircut and some clean shoes on, clean underwear on. Yeah, you 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 You're more attractive than anybody out there. You're presentable, yeah. yes. That is true. Now, another thing a lot of people probably don't know, you probably start getting this in the mail and people probably start volunteering. You have a love for sweets would tear you up in your weight training. Oh, yeah. Because Mr. Anders still work yeah. out now, people. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, sweets, is, sweets, it's my downfall. Uh, <laughs> and matter of fact, I was at the store today. We was picking up the food for the event this weekend, and they had this uh, seven, seven, what they call it, the seven-up pineapple cake or something like that at the store in Houston. There's a meat market we went to. 
And um, I had to get one of them. So I'm sitting in the car. We had to wait for about an hour to get the meat because was it's ground meat. They was already cutting it up and stuff. And uh, so I was sitting in the car waiting for it for about, you know, 30, 40 minutes. I said, I think they ate me some sweets. So that is my my downfall. Now, outside of being a great athlete, a family man, you love sweets. How in the world, outside of just brushing your teeth, you keep your teeth so white? Because everybody say, Mr. Anderson got some white teeth. So I was blessed. Hey, I tell you what, God has, has blessed me so much, man. Like, seriously. And a lot of people don't know this. I'm going to throw it out there and people take it for what it's worth. But as an, uh, as a child, again, you know, we grew up in Parkland, we, you know, uh, close to Cedar Terrace in a chop area, in an area. And my mom would, didn't work, so we didn't have, and pretty much we was on welfare, you know, truth be told. Because I, I used to hate to go to the store with the food stamps back in the days. But anyway, I'd never been to a dentist until I got to college. Wow. My college sometime late in my college. I've never been to a dentist to get a tooth clean or tooth pull or nothing. And I've never been, you know, another thing, truth be told, I've never been hospitalized before, like for us, like illness and staying overnight or getting injured and staying mm -hmm. overnight. You know, when I told my key attendant, that was like a, a one time deal. But before as being hospitalized, I've been very blessed with health and, 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 and just as much with my teeth, too. So i never been to a dentist. I didn't get that opportunity until I went to college. <laughs> never, from no child, from a childhood all the way up, never been to a dentist. Well, that in itself is a blessing, <laughs> man. And we continue to pray and wish you continued help. My last, with my, what some things that people may not know, in 1984, yourself and a childhood friend went and got baptized at Live Oak Baptist Church. What brought that about? Was that conversation? Was it from family? Or was it a friend saying, hey, we out here doing what we're supposed to be doing? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? We need to go get blessed. Well, it, that year, so particularly that year, that purpose was we had a great feeling about our team, the Class 85. And I want to say we had a group of men that were willing to go into church and, and uh, together, and we all got baptized in 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 the same uh-oh. I still What's see you. I still got a connection. In the same situation. Uh, didn't know that. Sorry about that. Um, so as a team, we all went got baptized. Uh, and it was like the, pretty much uh, 80, 70, 60, 80% of the team that went to the church, went to the same church uh, every Sunday as a group. That's how we bonded in 1985. And again, we had a, a wonderful season. And it's due to that, in my opinion, because I believe we bonded as teammates and friendship. And, and then, you know, when you got Father God on your side, a lot of things happen. And it was a lot of times we probably shouldn't have done some of the things we've done, but God gave us a gift and God gave us the, the will to do it. And I, I do, um, you know, recognize that. And I 100% believe that's part of the success I've had to this day. You know what I mean? Without God, there's nothing to be possible. So that was just something... We did, and a short story too, because I was a in the church. Like I say, I thought I had a drug problem growing up, because my grandmother they drug us to church every Sunday. I used to go to Sunday school, Bible study, <laughs> seven days a week for since I was about what, four years old to about twelve years old. I was in church every day, <laughs> so we went seven days a week as a, as a kid. But so, but that was a special reason in 1985 that as a team and. You know, the guy you mentioned, Pep, is one of my best friends, that we all decided as a group to go, you know, get baptized, rebaptized at the time and, and join the church. Well, big shout out to Mr. Um, Edward Benjamin. I did reach out to him for some of these things that I'm asking on the show today. So big shouts out to him. Now, one of the things I wanted to bring up, we kind of um, touched into it. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Still can't hear me. See you, so. Um, well, we're having some connection problems, and we'll bring them back on once we get these fixed. Mr. Hans, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear, can you hear me? me now? Yes. I can hear you. 
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Well, let's see what we can do with these connections. Still can't hear me, Mr. Andrew? I say muted. Mic is muted. Can you hear me? But I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you off and try to bring you back on and see if we can get get the connection. Well, while we got Mr. Anders off, we're gonna try to um, reconnect with him and see if we can get him back back on. But um, like you said, he grew up in in um in Galveston. We kind of got into some what some things that you may not know about Kimball, and we went from him being in and in the Little Leagues Hall of Fame, in the Ray T. Shepard Little League Hall of Fame. He is a ping pong um, champion. Um, he has a fetish for shoes, and he used to buy two of the same pair of shoes every time he would buy shoes. And like he said, he would buy those shoes because growing up, they had to share sho shoes. So then he became fortunate enough where he can buy as many shoes um, as he wants. And one of the reasons being was because if he scuffed them up, he can um, put on another pair of shoes, which he didn't say he would give those shoes away um, as well when he was when he was young. If we have any um, viewers that are um, following the show on um, Facebook as well as on YouTube, please post your comments or questions. We can um, post them where Mr. Anders can see as well as other guests and we can get to those questions um, as well, um, trying to get, get them back on. Um, on the show and we talked about um sweets he have a love for sweets um he's been eating sweets ever since he was a, a little kid and he said he's been blessed that he never had to have to go into the hospital or had any teeth to be removed and um because he couldn't even afford to be able to go um to the dentist when he was a a, a little kid and in 1984 he was baptized brought faith into his life and it was brought upon by one of his childhood friends and Mr. Edward Benjamin, as well as their own football team that um, used to go to the church. So that was one of the things that brought him in the going back um, to the church as well. So as soon as we get him back on, we'll go into some more topics that we have for him going into um, playing in um, the Pro Bowl, as well as from college, I mean, high school to college and things um, like that. In the beginning of the show, if you missed that, I am Coach O, and this is National Scouting Service podcast show, and I think we have him coming back on now. Hold on a second. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hold on, we have something going on with his mic. Can you hear me now, Mr. Andrew? We have like a fluttering sound going on on your end. Mr. Andrew, can you? Hold on a second. Let me let him know that he got a like a fluttering sound going on. You can hear me now, Mr. Andrew. Mr. Andrew. Can you hear me? Mr. Andrews, we can hear you on our side. Can you hear us? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, Please, uh... here we go. Sorry about that. Don't worry about <laughs> that. These type of things things happen. And I just kind of gave him um, a, a replay of what we kind of talked about in the beginning of the of the show and things and whatnot. But now what i like to um, get into now, we already gave the introduction. Kim already told us a little about himself. We did the um, what people may not know. I went over that. Now i like to get into growing up in Galveston. A lot of people probably don't know that Mr. Anders grew up in Galveston, Texas. And why don't you give us a little insight about your growing up in Galveston, 
how things um, were and how the community was close knit and how did you strive from that and become a stronger person and going into sports and bettering yourself as well? Yeah. Uh, so I had an opportunity to grow up in Galveston and for me, it was, it was a beautiful thing because at that time the city was full of people, full of people that was in the community. Uh, we seen a lot of different things in the community. And at the same time, we had a lot of uh, leaders in our community. Uh, the Muslims were real strong back then. We had uh, people in the neighborhood. Like we had protectors in the neighborhood, even though it was a lot of rough stuff going on in Galveston. Uh, I mean, your teachers were on top of you about everything. If you got in trouble in school, uh, your parents would know. So we just had a lot of great people in the community uh, that looked out for the young kids and was teaching us the right things to do and making sure we're not going down the wrong path. And if we did, we will get in trouble. It was those situations where, uh, I, truth be told, hey, your neighbor can had the opportunity to whoop you. You know, we still get whooped in school. <laughs> the 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 shoot at that time, I mean, the principal was still appelling and stuff. You know, what I mean, your coaches and we were one thing you didn't want to get in trouble uh, as a kid growing up. And then, you know, that was about the seventies, sixties, seventies, eighties era, where a lot of things were just so different, and uh, the streets was a lot rougher back then uh every day at any given time it's a thousand people outside because we didn't we didn't have the video games at the time so we were outside every day uh shooting basketball playing football i think all our skill sets came from being outside all day because you had to be creative when you were outside and you know like again playing ping pong and racquetball we learned how to do badminton we learned so many things at the rec center and that's why the boys and girls club was so vital to me growing up with a boys club at the time. And then Raccoon Park, that was some of my vital uh, places there where I was able to escape, you know, the times when I was at home uh, and, and and being able to go outside and be free and just enjoy life. And uh, like, again, at, I think at some point it had been over a thousand people just outside hanging out, whether it was, you know, guys, to be told, some shooting basketball, some under the dome shooting dice. It depends on whatever you want to do, whatever you want to protect you in that you had the opportunity to do. But again, I always say we had some of the old school guys I always looked out for us. I can remember actually uh, Bo, John Silver and Dad used to lift weights and stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. He'll take us over there. We'll be lifting heavy weights. And we, you know, I don't think we was of age. We was probably 13, 14 at the time, you know, when uh, he got kind of got us stuck on weight. So we should see him outside all the time. Uh, he's big old swole guy, just muscular. So he out there just lifting weights every day. And so he pulled us over there. And we started getting in this routine and, and just being taught the right thing to do. And that's the one thing I will say uh, about the 70s uh, upbringing, that we had the community where a lot of people let us do too much wrong. They made sure that they seen anything, either they going to handle it or they going to let your mama or your daddy know. So it's going to be some consequences of everything you do. And uh, so it was a great time for me to be growing up in that era and particularly the discipline where we, I believe that we had uh, as, as any athletic sport, you know what I mean? Uh, because it was a consequence of everything we did. We couldn't miss a practice. I don't know if I ever missed a practice in my life. I had to have been like, you know, just, I don't think I have been sick enough to miss a practice, but you know, growing up there, man, it was a blessing. And, you know, again, the Cattle Beach weekends was off the chain for a long time. Yeah, and, I remember those. So, so we enjoyed it. I mean, being on the island, just think about it. And I, I tease a lot of people. I say I'm from the island. That's what I call it, you know, when I'm trying to be fancy with it. But Galveston is a beautiful place, and we just had a lot of fun. And, and, and like I said, it's a great small niche community where everybody know everybody. If you don't know them, ask them their first name or last name. Even to this day, you know who they are. And then also one of my stories is uh, when I know somebody from Galveston, when I hear them say Cooney, I could be a, a million miles away. If they say Cooney, I look, I say, oh, he's from Galveston. They got he to be from Galveston. So uh, like I said, man, it was a true blessing for me to be coming from a, a town like Galveston. And, and as you know, a lot of guys have have went on to do greater things, and and you know particularly in football. And we had you know a great track program, and those guys did a lot of great things. But for us football, a lot of guys uh, paid their way to get out of Galveston and be able to have opportunity to play in the National Football League. 
And I, if I'm not mistaken, we're in the top five or 10 nationally wise mm -hmm. of having the most guys from one high school uh, going to NFL. And, and that's a testament to itself. Um, and again, we produced a lot of athletes and it was just a fun, competitive environment. Um, man, we played, you know, our freshmen, we played JV, me, Pepper. We had 12 guys on the, on the, on the JV team coming in as freshmen. So uh, we had to go against these guys every day and compete. So it taught me a lot about life skills. It taught me a lot about the game itself and the toughness. And I think that's what it transitioned to what, when I went to NFL, when I played with older guys coming in as a rookie or coming in as a freshman in college, that you have the understanding and the mindset that, you know, it wasn't the age, it's just the mental capacity of how you play the game and how you view the game, which makes you, yeah. Go, go ahead. Well, see, it's, it's, I'm glad you, you hit on that because I was going to get into that next subject. Like, what was the important, the importance of family and friends? And you kind of touched on that. But to get into the ending part, because you already hit on everything that I was going to say about the importance of being in the neighborhood, how the people would bring you in, the lift weights, right. going to the boys club in Rock Uni. But what part did that play, um, if any, in your career from youth to youth sports, which we're going to touch on on the next subject? Okay into high school and college. But if you just want to give about just the importance of having family and friends at the time as you was coming up, go ahead and do that. Yeah, so family is, is most importantly the first step of stone that you have. You have to have some support uh, from your family. And truth be told, uh, my mother wasn't that much into sports, but she allowed me to play. Uh, she wasn't around. She probably, be honest, she didn't come to not one football game. Uh, she came to her first football game. And uh, when I was in the NFL, we came and played the Houston Oilers back in the days. That was the, the first Oilers. game she Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, we were back that far, whatever that the night is. So, man, you're telling your age, man. <laughs> I know, I know. But that that was not a thing, but she did support me. She allowed me to play. And, um, and you know, my brother, he wasn't engaged in sports. But, you know, at the time, it was so many athletes in Galveston. Again, we had people that sound like football players. We had people that was known to be the best running back in the history of the game, but they never had opportunity to do it in a in a organized sport and excel in it, you know. And uh, so I was able to take transition myself into being this neighborhood phenom because I was playing. Matter of fact, my freshman year, eighth grade. I can go on a basketball court and play with the, the seniors in high school and the grown men. And we was on the same court together. And I would probably get picked like the fourth, the third or fourth pick on the five-man roster when they're doing five-on-five five whole court mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> five-man roster. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Hey, we was in the hood, man. We played. That's, that's all we did. We played every day. Every day was an outside activity for us. We did not sit in the house. And the only time we sat in the house, we had to go do homework and go to sleep and eat. Other than that, we were outside all day. So a lot of a lot of upbringing that that taught me how to be competitive, and that's one thing. Even every day when I was in NFL, you think about this: you have to go earn your job every year. I did it for ten years, and then and, and for a minute, the first two I had to work my way up in. But once I got my job, I held it for that eight years. You know, I made sure, but I had to come in and compete every day, and I knew what that looked like. You know, because I I would never feared anything. I wasn't scared of of competition. I wasn't scared of somebody. I mean, they drafted third round picks, first round picks every year. They bring somebody in to take my job. But you know, you just got to be just continue to be competitive and be the best you can be. Okay. Now let's talk about um, youth sports. We knew you grew up in Galveston. Can't say right. that enough. Big shots out to Galveston, Texas, where we both are from. Boi, born on the island. But you play youth sports. And it was a guy that took a lot of interest in you and Mr. Johnny Enriquez. What can you say was his impact with you in sports and from playing you sports? Because as we said before, Kimber is all Kimber is also a Hall of Famer in baseball from the Ray T. Shepherd League. And you excelled, you excelled in youth sports as well. So a little about youth sports, how that impacted you in, in your way going into high school, as well as with, with Johnny Enriquez being an impact with you as well. Oh, absolutely. Johnny Enriquez, uh, let's start, start the Mexican guy. He, uh, truly, truly be told, he's more over the boxing program and stuff. 
But I used to watch them because I used to go to the boys' club back in Magnolia days when they just had the boys' club. And and they had this boxing team and stuff. And Johnny was a fierce competitor. I think he boxed a little bit on his own. But I seen a group of guys that he was training. And it's just one you just want to be part of something like that. And he took us in. We started our football league at the time. And and Johnny took us in at, at that time. And, and we just got guys that wanted to play. And it was real competitive. And he taught us a lot. Uh, again, the discipline and doing the right thing, the fundamentals. Back to this, the fundamentals of the football, we learned everything about the fundamentals first. It was never no fancy stuff. It was never, you know, you could dribble this or do that. But it was the fundamental, the basic fundamentals on how to play football. And that's something that Johnny taught us from the beginning. And it carried over throughout my whole life because if you if you focus on the fundamentals and you get that down, you can expand your horizon as far as possible. Uh, and then the work ethics. Uh, one thing that I will say that we work. I mean, it, 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 when you become a football player, even when you think you need to be working, you need to be working because it's an ongoing work ethic that you got to develop and you got to elevate every year you never can get as good as you want because you just got to put the work in every day and you got to be willing to do it and that's one thing I, I would say that kept me motivated that one thing I may have not been the best player on the team but I was gonna be the hardest worker on the team and I pride myself off of that okay now you saying you were one of the best players on the team now let's get, into high, let's get into <laughs> high school sports because I beg the differ. I want to brag a lot about this, and that's why we want to do this show because a lot of people know about Kimball Anders as the, the NFL player, the Hall of Famer, and stuff like that. And before we get into that, big shouts out to um, Tim Park. He said, what's good, fam? He's on the show. He's tuning in along with others. And if you want to post comments or questions, please be um, sure to do so, and we'll try to get these questions or comments up for Mr. Anders to see as well. Now, let's talk about high school. What high school did you, you attend? <laughs> Galveston Ball. <laughs> Gal Galveston Ball. Yeah. Now, at, at Galveston Ball, you already kind of went in that as a freshman, you was on JV. Yes. And that's not heard of. Sometimes they keep freshmen on freshman teams. Some freshmen are fortunate enough to move up and play varsity. It's been a fair, a very few to do that. Yeah, now, when you, was in, when you was in high school, what was your primary position before you became this big time running back that you don't want to brag about? Uh, I was a cornerback. I was, I was, <laughs> I, I was, I was the best quarterback. On the oh, team. you, you was the it's, best quarterback. Now, if your brother was on here listening to this man, he probably come on and be a big old argument. He's gonna hear it though. He and I tell him <laughs> that all the time. But we, like I say, we had we had some talent, man. I think particularly in before even before class eighty five. But our 85 class, we had some talent. We we put 15 people on JV off the off our A grade team. So that's saying a lot. And then the next year, I believe we had 15 or 20 that was on varsity as sophomores and started. We had at least eight to ten starters on, on varsity. So uh we was loaded with talent, man. And 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 then too, off off of that, off of that team, we had what three guys or four guys go to the NFL. We had we had eight to ten Division One players off of one in eight, class eighty five. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's some numbers that that's hard to beat. You know what I mean? And I know we had some others that's been close, but uh, those are some phenomenal numbers when you get that much talent on a team. Now, when you when you went to Ball High, a lot of schools don't have this. Y'all had a total of two campuses, correct? Yes. And I, I showed that on the screen. So it was a Ball High North. Ball. And did y'all call the other schools south, or it was just south? Ball? It was south, Ball High North okay. and south. So with these two schools, it wasn't like all the freshmen went to one school and all the other classmates was, went to the other school. Yeah, we had it set up with different classes you took on the north side and different classes you took on the south side. Uh, but you had to walk back and forth. And the craziest thing, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if it ever rained that much, but we never missed class and that was never late. We had to walk. We had, I don't know, what, a seven-minute time period. But going back and forth to two different campuses at one time, which was, a you know, a good block and a half away, uh, that was, it was fun. It was great. And it was just different, you know what I mean? Um, but it worked for us. And, and we ate lunch on, on that side of campus sometime or the other side, depending on what class skills you have. 
it was it was definitely different. I don't think they can get rid of that, that type of stuff now. <laughs> and, then, and then we had open lunch. Where we, I was we, about to say, we had when open I've, lunch. I've heard, because I've ten ball high too, and I went through it. I'm saying I heard. We had open campus where you would be able to yeah. leave for an hour yeah, and come back. Crazy. But I think <laughs> in these day and times, you, you can't do that now. No, we, hey, we used to go to, I tell you what, shrimp and stuff was our favorite place to go to. Man, big shout shrimp, out to shrimp and stuff. Oh, yeah, they was they was making some real good money then. I probably I don't think, but the food, I mean, give or take, I'm gonna go on them a, a po shrimp po bar is probably what two dollars, three dollars. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know now po bar is probably about fifty dollars, you know. So, right back then, we got two dollars in our pocket, we was golden. Wow, yeah. now, I'm gonna bring this up because a lot of people don't know this as well. Mr. Anders was an outstanding basketball player now. Also, oh, now good. to this day and time, he's playing in celebrity basketball events, and now he say he can't dribble, which he's an outstanding okay. dribbler in high school. Okay. He was able to dunk the ball. I don't know if he can still be able to to, to do that. But I'm gonna put this picture up, and before we start explaining all these, pictures, <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> we have a picture up here, and that's Kimball with number two on. And then we have another picture on shooting the basketball. You was number 25? Yes, sir, 25. Okay, now explain the numbers, number two and number 25. Why number two in football and why number 25 in, in basketball? So number two, uh, truth be told, man, it, uh, I grew up, uh, that's when the time I was staying by the chopper down and by Cedar Terrace, and uh, they had this guy, you're going to remember his name, William Ashton was a quarterback <laughs> for Ball High. I tell you what, bro, when we were at Ball High, here's, here's one thing I will, so, so we'll skip. When we was at Ball High, we didn't look at the NFL as being our heroes. We looked at Ball High. Them guys that was playing, your Charles Alexanders, your, your, your William Ashes, all them guys played before us. That stadium was packed every, every game, and that's who the guys I looked up to initially coming out of, you know, at, at an early age, whether it's elementary to junior high, uh, we weren't too much keen in on the NFL as much, you know. I know the Oilers was close here, but, you know, at, at that time we only had, what, three channels, and if you didn't see a game, you probably won't see it. So we weren't that big on that. So those guys at Ball High at the time we looked up to, and that was some of my, my role models. So for wearing number two, because he was so such a great quarterback, I always wanted to wear that number. Number two. Well, and big 25. shout out to uh, yeah. Mr. William Ashton, who was also a youth football coach yeah. and a police officer in our community. So big shouts out to you. That's yeah. from myself and Mr. Um, Kimball Anders on the show. Now, we feel to get into some stats because, as you said, you was a, a, a cornerback. When did you convert to running back? And when did you realize, like, hey, I really can do something at this position? Well, it's my sophomore year. I played a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. I played, I rotated with with my brother Israel Martin. Uh, was that it? That's that was a, yeah, my sophomore year, right? So because mm -hmm. yeah, so two, he two years, and I rotated with him a little bit, but not really played that much. And then mm -hmm. going into my junior year, uh, I think it was like the first game uh, we played Lufkin, and you know. I, I kind of felt that I was a good athlete, so it was never running back or defensive back. But at the time, again, I didn't know which one I was going to, you know, uh, flourish in. And so coming into my junior year, um, after the first game, Pepper was the – Pepper was uh, – Pepper Mr. going to – Benjamin. Mr. Yeah. Benjamin. <laughs> he, he was the start running back. He didn't do so well in the game. So I went in and, I don't know, scored a couple of touchdowns, three touchdowns, 100-something yards. And from that point on, I took over the starting running back job. And then, you know, Pep was starting on, on defense too. So, and, 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 and it was a, just a transition for me to be on, be the start running back now. And so I took over that position from that day forward and went on and figured out. But by the time I, after my junior year, going into my senior year, I was committed to being a full time running back. I really felt that, uh, with the work we did over the off season, like again, Coach Ted Umhagen, great coach, man. Like I say, and it, again, coach it's a lot of coaches that have guided us through a lot of a lot of the times we've been through. From you know, even at the Volunteers, we played the Volunteers. That one picture you show, uh, his name was John John something too. It's like a lot of different coaches had influenced me 
And what the biggest thing I got out of was just how to work and how to be disciplined, how to how to understand the game. So, but going in my senior year, I figured that you know I want to be a true running back, and so I, you know, went on. We bust out butt the whole off season, and that's what I was focused on. And I felt really good about it. And you know, obviously that year was a, a great year for me. And we didn't even play a full. And one thing a lot of people don't know, I had nine nineteen hundred fifty two yards uh for that season and 28 touchdown but we went eight and zero in district right and the second half of every game besides i think it was one game that we hit we didn't play the second we didn't play the whole second half that was just if that was just in the first two quarters of all of the yards i got for that season wow yeah because we, we was up 56 to 50 something then uh you know so we didn't. We have, have, we, we have not to cut you off, Coach um, Anders, Mr. Anders. No. We have a question by another Tim Park, and he asks, "What type of offense did you all um, have in high school?" So, so truth be told, it was, it was it's called the I formation, but it's a joke behind this. They say it was Kimball <laughs> Anders right and Kimball Anders left. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, I carried the ball thirty-two times a game. Thirty-two wow. times, and that was, and like I say, most of that was done before the half. I mean, I get 15, 20 carries the first half automatic. I mean, it was at that point, my senior year, we was committed to the run. And we had our offensive line was, was pushing 300, averaging 315 pounds at that time. So we and had what a lot of, and what a lot of people don't know either is Mr. Anders was one of the strongest players on that team with these offensive lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Say, hey, I, I know a lot, yeah, and I'm going to get an audience why I know a lot. But let's go back to what you were saying earlier, like the players that you all looked up to. And I like that because, for one, like you said, nobody was worrying about the NFL. If anything, it was it was about getting out of Galveston and going to college. And then for two, for the players that would come back home that had the chance to go to college, these are the players that we looked, looked up to as well as like myself. But um, you, you speak of your, the numbers you wore, number two and 25. When I was coming through high school, Galveston Ball, the Golden Tornadoes, I always had to hear that your uncle wore this number, your uncle wore this number. Um, you need to do this is what, what they did. And that kind of motivated me. It wasn't no look up to Tony Dorsett or Herschel Walker. It was the people that was either in my family or the people that I was able to see and put my hands yeah. on. Um, coming into my um, junior and senior year, I wanted to wear number four, his brother number. But that number was taken by another great athlete by the name of Mr. Roy Smith, so I couldn't get that number. So I had to wear number two. But wearing that number two came with a lot of responsibility. Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. get to meet up to the expectations <laughs> that this young man met up to. But with that being said, and I'm going to tell you why. In Kimball's, um, I think this was his senior year, um, he played for Galveston Ball High School where he produced 342 carries for 1,000. 932 yards. Now, with them 1,932 yards, I had wrote this down, but um, <laughs> yeah, hold on, yeah. hold on, because I think it was you were 63 yards short of 2,000, so I think you were slacking. I think you could have got them 63 yards, but I think you, you probably took off some plays on that. But he also he also had 28 touchdowns to go along with being the Texas top running back in the state and this is also you can find and i think i posted this you can find this on texas high school football history.com it's not no lie and with him being able to do that won't you explain to us these two individuals that came to your school to meet you oh yeah there was a there was a top dogs at running back that's eric Dickinson, and errol campbell so uh both of those guys uh were recruiting me uh university of texas university of uh of SMU, uh, obviously, you know, I chose University of Houston, but, you know, that, that was back in the days when the big, big time guys come down and see you and, and try to recruit you, give you a outlook on what you can uh, look up, look for when you go to state day college. So, yeah, they came down there quite a few times doing my, my air. And, and again, we had a class, man, we had uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma used to come down here a lot. They Truth be told, like with, with Eric Hill, Eric Hill was one of the top recruits. They flew a helicopter in for him to get to get him up to to come to the school. It was just kind of a lot of stuff going on at the time. But we was we was real recruit. Like I said, 
12 Division One players went to college off our, off our high school, 85 class. Dang. Big shouts out to Mr. Eric Blade Hill. Went to LSU, played for the Arizona Cardinals, also from Galveston Ball High School. Now, with them two individuals coming to your school, you had one pulling you to go to SMU, the other pulling you to go to Texas. And I'm pretty sure they they respected you a lot because they came back down a couple of times to, to, to see you some other times. How was that to tell one that, hey, I'm not going to this school and tell the other I'm not going to that school either. I'm going to you a favor. Right. Hey, at some point, you just got to make your mind up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> tough over there. Hey, yeah, I, I, I said, but I'm going to get to that, but go ahead and finish answering that. 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 That's part of the process, though, you know, and, be, and being recruited is a hard process, just for the young people to know. Uh, you have to make your mind up what you're going to do, and you got to be honest and let them know, okay, I like your school, but I chose to go here. You can't play when it comes down to recruit. You can't deceive uh, colleges when it comes down to recruit. So whenever you decide to get in this here, if you get the opportunity, make your mind up and and, lead, and 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 go with it. Go with your mind, your heart, whatever your decision is. Let it be that decision. Don't be. Don't wave the fence. Don't 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 do that because then um, a lot of college that will see you differently though because you get in the wrong position and and kind of you know toying with their mind and doing this and doing that. It can come off really bad. So make a decision and, and live with it. You know what I mean? You got to live with it, uh, whichever way it go. Okay, we have um, another question from one of our um, viewers, Miss Nicola Wells, and she said, when is Mr. Anders going to start some youth camps? He has a lot of, he has a lot to offer our youth. Yeah, we, that's in the making right now. Uh, my foundation is back up, running back, giving back. So we definitely will do some, some youth camps, uh, focus on a lot of different things too. Uh, not just the sport itself. We talking about uh, discipline. We talking about financial literacy. We talking about a lot of different things. So uh, we are it's in it's in progress right now. So we working on uh, getting that back uh, kicked up down this area. And that is that is um, much needed. And Mr. Edward Benjamin, which is Mr. Kimball Anders' brother, he had this to post. And twenty two played went out. Um, to school. I don't know what he meant by that. And then total twenty-two. Uh, total. Huh? It's a total twenty-two. Oh, a total of twenty-two. Yeah. And then he got Carl Hilton. What he? Oh, he, Carl Hilton played out of Galveston Ball. Went to the Minnesota Vikings. And I think that's what he's um talking about. And then he also on uh, Mr. Parks had put, "What was your main reason you picked to go to the University of Houston?" Oh man, this is gonna be this is gonna blow everybody mind. It was well, University of Houston at the time they just came off a Cotton Bowl win. Uh, however, so when you have this bond and friendship with some people, which Israel Martin was one of my uh, that's one of my brothers, one of my best friends at the time, and Carl Hilton was there. Wow, at, at the same time he was there at the same time. It was more for me um, that I think the University of Houston, the, the way they recruited me. They treated me really, really fair. But at the end of the day, I wanted to play with some of my gals and people. I had connections with them already. So I had that friendship and that bond already with them. And on all other trips I went to, there was nobody there that I really knew or I could, felt like I could trust. You know what I mean? So uh, that's one of the reasons, man, because I had, it was like going, being part of Galveston again. You got, you got Israel, you got, and, and you and, it's, and at the time it was close to home and my grandmother uh she had passed away my freshman year and i wanted to be stay close to home as well too because my grandmother was uh in hospice at the time when i first went to college she passed uh during my freshman year okay now since we we got college going on we're gonna we're gonna step into the college because then after that we have professional um your professional career as well as going into the Hall of Fame. And I find this to be amazing, too, because, again, Mr. Anders, he's, he's been bashful. He was, a, he was a great athlete, still a great person in the individual. Okay, you went to um, U of H. Now, yeah, man. You know, okay, now, while you was at U of H, um, how was it being at the University of Houston? It was, it was different. Um, it was fun. I mean, we had went there. Uh, coach Yoma was the first coach we uh, encountered and you know we ran a veer offense and that's the reason I went there to be in a veer offense and I wanted to run the ball every down uh, unfortunately 
after my freshman year, he got fired and we went into the run and shoot offense. And I've had, I had some success there as a sophomore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, throughout the years, you know, you're going you to go into that story. It's oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. Yeah. Now, when you was at U of H, how was the life at U of H in this building right here? And what was the name of this building at the time when you was at University of Houston? Oh, that's a, that's a, was that the Towers? Yes, sir. That's the old Towers. Yeah. Oh, man, that was, it was, that was a party. <laughs> it, it was a party. It was, it was a lot of parties. <laughs> that was a party, right? Like, that's, so, yeah, that's, that's a problem right there. That, that was a problem. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, when you go to college, man, you, nah, you really got to stay focused because you got school, you got practice, and you got so much on your plate, and you got to pick and choose your parts. And you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, being that environment, uh, I would advise anybody to make sure they stay focused and, and getting their main objective. Uh, now, hindsight 2020, I always say this when you get the opportunity to go to college, you want to graduate. And that's the end game at the end of the day. And, you know, and, and truth be told, I didn't have that mindset going into it. I went there, I wanted to start off in criminal justice, and I didn't really like it as much as I thought I did, or it was a little too hard for me and to do that in football. And so, um, but I encourage everybody, you know, find out the reason why they're going to school and what they want to take and what that school have to offer. Uh, if, if you get a scholarship, you want to make sure you earn that degree. Right, that's what's up. And I was going to ask you what your, your major was, but you already. It started off in criminal justice. You. Yeah, it started yeah. off with, and it was it was tough. It was it was now, tough. When you when you went to U of H, you said y'all ran the, the wing tee. Oh, we ran the, uh, the, the veer. The, the veer. veer. What was your position when, when you was there at U of H? Running back. Running back, running I was back. A, I was I was a legitimate running back, not a so that's a whole different fullback running back. So they had two backs. So it was the veer, the ride, shake, all that stuff. And they had like one of the best quarterbacks in the in the country at the time, Gerald Landry. Uh they had a guy from Willie Davis, uh what's his name? Willie Davis or something Davis. They had like some great quarterbacks come through there. And then great running backs. They had Raymond Tate. Raymond Tate was like Six two two forty, and ran about like a, a yeah, running back. as a running back and ran like a, a a deer, and also Randy Collins came there with me. My counterpart there was at Laporte. Randy came to U of H at the same time. Both of us went to U of H together. As a matter of fact, we was roommates at one time. Wow. And he, yeah, we was we was cool. He was cool. We was always cool to this day. And when I see Randy, it's just it's just a joy to see him. You know what I mean? So, okay, so but but now you're leaving out another part of the offense that you played in too, which was the run and the, shoot. Correct? The run and shoot, yes, yes. So that was that was after my, like I say, Coach Joma got fired after my freshman year. And then we go to the run and shoot. I come my first year, I got a plat on the wall. I rushed for eight hundred something yards and caught seven hundred something and and got some all these accolades. And unfortunately, uh, come my junior year, they bring in. Uh, a guy again. You always competing for your job, and your job can be taken. And and he was a top recruit, and they decided to put him at the. Uh, so he we played it, rotated a little bit. My junior, year. my senior year, they moved me to inside receiver. I was, I was that about was, to, that, was, that was one of the videos I showed when you caught like a little bubble. Right. Right. I would, I, I, I truth be told, and I, I never, I never say I would be a quitter because I would never quit anything. But I was I was pretty pissed off at the time when it happened. But at the same time, I say, well, I'm still playing football. I'm, I'm start inside receiver, so I'm still playing. I still get my hand on the ball. So And, and it worked out um, in the long run, and we could talk about that a little later. But switching to, to that position your senior year, going into everything, uh, junior, well, senior year, going to my, my senior year, so I was starting inside receiver, and that's how I finished my career at the University of Houston. Okay, um, well, and Mr. Anders, we have a question because I don't want him to – I don't want to lose him. Mr. Tim Park said, do you think the run and shoot helped with your hand skills? Yeah, 100%. I caught, We caught 100 balls every day, and that's the flip side of, of uh, the bigger story, like the most catches in Chiefs history. So, you know, my hands are, are registered. You know what I mean? I want to catch it, what? 
what? How many? Uh, uh, you, you probably got you got. This oh, no, we're not, we, gonna, we, we ain't gonna we ain't gonna get we ain't gonna get into yeah, that. I'm gonna get yeah. to that. You ruined it. All right, okay. now let's I'm get into saying, this. We, lead, we leading into because that, we, it's, yeah, we are gonna lead into that. It's, so here's the thing: it's a blessing and cursing at the same time. Now here's one thing I will say: sometimes you're in a position that whether you, for me, like in my mind, I say oh, I can I can quit because somebody took my job or they or they gave somebody my job. Oh, let's say that because that's what's happening now. A lot of people getting these transport portals because they don't want to compete or they can't compete. I don't know. But I decided to stay there and compete and become a receiver instead of uh, being a running back. And it hurt me through the draft. It hurted me from getting cut from the Steelers. But in the long run, the rest is See, you, you jump. You jump in the gun. You I jump know. in the gun. Mr. Mr. Um, yeah. Mr. Tim said he was like, wow. I see that's how OB ran the wing bubble play so good. Learn from his um. I'm going to say I have the better hands, but he's going to say he have the better hands because in 96, myself and Mr. Anders, we had a bet who would have the most catches in the year, and I think he had 66, and I think I had 60 or 63, but he won that battle. I couldn't pay the, the bet that I thought I was going to win because he was going to be able to shell out more, and when I lost, I couldn't meet up to what I was supposed to owe. Now, let's get into this. We're still on U of H. Okay. I'm going to read this. Kimball Anders played at the University of Houston where he produced 261 carries for 1,359 yards and 16 touchdowns to go with 115 receptions. I now, know, check right? this out. For yeah. 1,718 <laughs> yards yeah. and 11 scores. Now, being a featured running back, the best in Texas, going to U of A, how in the hell did you have more yards receiving than catching? That that's the way it was set up. We, that's we threw the ball every day. I mean, receiving and rushing. Yeah, that's that's how it was set up for me, man. And and again, it was a blessing and cursing at the same time because I want to say, being in the running shoot, we was a little more advanced, we was a little ahead of of the curve because we know went to the running shoot, we couldn't be stopped for some years, and it took some them some years to figure out what we was doing with the running back, with the receivers, and all that stuff. So. uh Jack Party was ahead of the game a little bit. And obviously, he produced Andre Ware. Andre Ware won the Heisman Trophy our senior year. Now, you know, with us not being a top ranked team, you know, although I think we were ranked, but we weren't like the top five in the nation. And, but, you know, we got some national exposure by that and, you know, wind up being the number one offense in the whole country, I believe. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Y'all we were at the one, time. If I'm not mistaken, we're the number one offense in the, in the whole country. We put up, I mean, I hate to say it, but we put up 95 points on SMU. And I was, now that was what our first string player played the first half. And then after that, we we put our second. And David Klinger is our backup. So, I mean, we just had a – we just had a – no, David Dacus. David Dacus was our backup. We just had some – we had some talent at the time, too, at University of Houston uh, during, that, during that era, especially when they came with the running suit because then you got Manny Hazard. We started getting a lot of different people, man. And we – so even at University of Houston, we had four guys, uh, five, six, big old, eight, nine guys get got drafted in a, between the first and the third round. Wow. Now, and, that's another thing a, a lot of people don't know, too, and I'm going to bring this up. You said you played running back and inside receiver, correct? Yes, correct. In 19, uh, um, 1988 – it was some other big-time running backs that Mr. Andrews had to compete against in the NCAA football division. Anthony Thomas out of Indiana led in rushing attempts. Mm -hmm. Barry Sanders out of Oklahoma State mm -hmm. University led in rushing yards. Mm -hmm. Chuck Weatherspoon, one of Kimball's teammates out of University of Houston, mm -hmm. led in rushing yards per attempt. Now, what Kimball, uh, Mr. Andrews failed to tell y'all, he also was a punt returner, believe it or not. Now, yeah. I understand why he used to always get on me about dropping the ball because I didn't know yeah. in college yeah. that he returned punts because I never saw that. I only seen him playing running back. But what y'all need to know, the number one punt returner in the nation yeah. at the time yeah. was yeah. Mr. Deion Sanders. Sanders. Yeah. Now, he yeah. go to catch to all of this now. Deion Sanders was the number one punt returner in the nation. Um some may have not have known what Kimball could have done if he would have continued um, to return punts 
But Deion Sanders in 11, in 11 games had 33 returns for 503 yards. He had an average of 15.2. Let me say that again. 11 games, 33 returns, 503 yards, and 15.2 average. <laughs> now, I'm not bragging on Deion Sanders because this is Mr. Kimball Anders' show. Did y'all know Kimball um, returned punts in 11 games in 1988? I mean, he returned punts in 11 games. He only had 17 returns. Deion Sanders had 33. Kimball had a total of 205 yards and had an average of 12.1 in 11 games. Now, just imagine if he would have did it in 30 in 11 games and had 33 returns, and Kimball was in the top 20 in the nation as a punt return and only had 17 returns. Hey, that's a good stat. I don't know where you found that at, but I knew that. But you didn't know that. that. I know I knew that. I because I, I, I'm gonna tell you one thing too. So it so it was a pretty yard. It wasn't because of the numbers. But per yard, if I if I bobble the ball one time, that last game against Rice, I would have beat Dion in that per yard carry thing, a per yard average. Average, yeah. Fit, yeah, I would have beat him in that, and Dion was, a, and I was nowhere near like a Dion, but 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 I caught the ball that I read, you know what I mean? Yeah, but, but see that yeah. that's an interesting thing to know because a lot of people don't know that. That's why I asked oh, yeah, you about the that. position you play, running back and receiver. But to leave that. out that. To be in that same category now, Mr. Anders wasn't number one or number two. He was in the top 20. No. But yeah, just yeah. think if he would have got a couple of more returns, just like Deion yeah. Sanders, no telling what could have happened. Oh, no. It, hey, it, it was just something to do, bro. I, I promise you. <laughs> hey, that was that I wanted. That was that you wanted but, to do? Because you're a lovely so, man back there by yourself. So, so at the same time, here's the one thing I would say, though. I had the opportunity to play football and I still I play receiver and I, I did punt return. I did kickoff return. That's once you get a responsibility as a player, you got to be willing to accept it. You can't. And that's another thing I say. You can't dictate what you're going to be. You can't dictate you're going to be a running back, defensive back, because some guys don't want to change positions. Some guys don't want to go try a punt. You may be, you know, so you still could be productive as a, a football player. And then at the end of the day, you're helping your team. If they think you fit here, you know, it, it may be the best fit for you. You just never know. I mean, I know a lot of people look, oh, my son should be doing this. He should be doing this. But, you know, I think for the most part, the coaches are not always right. But they have an idea where we, where, where can we use your son at. And But with that said, I'm just saying to some of the kids, don't get discouraged on where you play at. Be willing to play any position. Just go out there and ball. Whatever you do, go out there and play. Give it your all. And good things can happen. That's another good thing. That, I mean, it, it, it helped me in the long run. It helped me right. focus the, the things, you know, doing those things. It, it could, at the time, I thought it hurted me, but at the, I but just never knew what it can do. So I'm, I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to do that, and it really helped me. And I want you to find this out because I say this, and I'm going to throw this out here. I don't think I ever made all Southwest Conference in college, but I think I did because did. that number. Of, but you did. they, I don't see it nowhere. And 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 the reason I'm saying that because I'm going to go to U of H now. They got all mm -hmm. the all Southwest Conference people. My name is not up there, so. <laughs> but well, but we, I thought we're going to get the I, documentation so we can give it to them. Because when I looked up some of these stats, yeah, you was um all Southwest Conference. I thought I did one year though. I don't know what year that was though, but I thought I did. I'm at the I'm at I'm gonna have to research that, but but you and it might have been and it might have been for uh it might have been for uh for punt return. That's what I think it was for. I don't think it was for running back. And I it, it went for receiver. I'm I'm a, I'm a, I don't I'm gonna have to look that. that up. Now let's get okay. into your your All professional right. life. A lot of people don't know as oh, well. Okay. In 1990, you was um picked up by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, when you was picked up by by them, how was that? And do you feel you could have had made that team or you don't think that you was was ready for the professional level yet? And there were some things you learned that took on to into your next journey. No, I, I, I definitely should have made that team. The unfortunate thing it was a number situation. So here, here's what what happened. Um, so it's a number thing. You go carry five running backs. They drafted Richard Bell in the first in, in the 
You know, it's drafted Barry Foss in the first round, which is a great back out of Arkansas. Richard Bell from Nebraska in the third round. They had Merrill Hodge as a fullback. They had Tim Worley as another back. And they had another guy named Warren, Warren something, which was like a third down back. And so they already had five backs. So the, the backfield was loaded. I led the team in rushing the whole uh, preseason and everything. But again, when it came down to, to making a decision, they decided to stick with the older guy. So it, 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 it so that that's the way it unfolded for me, and it was unfortunate because I did enough to make the team because I led the team in the preseason and the rushing and everything. Probably played the most uh, besides the first round draft pick Barry Foster. You know how that go? He was first and third round. You're not cutting them. You got Merrill Hodge was a, a, a great fullback slash running back, back at and the time. Tim Worley at the time was one of the best backs in the league. Like I say, they kept Warren, a guy named Warren. They kept him over me, which was, you know, the decision they made. And, and I remember to this day, it was it was heart, heart, heartbreaking because, you know, he uh, Chuck Noll at the time told me, hey, Kimball, I think you're a great football player, uh, and I think you'll play in the NFL, but it just won't be here. And wow. That, that's, that, that's the exact words. And I just, my heart just dropped because it was the last cut, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I really felt that not knowing what I know now, and that's my that's my that's my story, but I don't can't tell you how they really thought. But that was my reason. I think that I didn't make it because they kept the older guy with me. And at, at that time, it wasn't about. Truth be told, it was so it wasn't even free agency then. It was about they had no tra only thing they could do is get traded or cut, and they couldn't do nothing else. So at that time, we're like it is now, like a lot of free agent stuff. So so, and I think that's the reason I got cut from them uh, because at the end of the day, I. I mean, if I led the team in rushing in a, in a whole preseason, and it'd be should hard to cut. Roster. Yeah, it should have been on roster. That's just my that's just my take, and I'm, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Now, with this, I'm going to read this off, and I'm going to let you explain to this. In 1990, you was picked up by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay. Mm -hmm. You sat out a year. You was working out. You was back at home working out with your brother, um, Mr. Edward Benjamin, Edward Pepper mm -hmm. Benjamin, working out, getting yourself back in shape. Did you think you was going to have an opportunity to get picked up by a team or you was just waiting for a call? Man, I had no earthly idea, but one thing I did do, uh, oh. Pepper Pe Pe helped me out a lot. Uh, I was sitting home for a few weeks once I got, well, actually not after I got cut, but I've missed the whole season. Let's, let's, let's fast forward. Uh, the whole season of not getting picked up. And, you know, my agent told me I'd probably get picked up and all that stuff. Uh, but I did not get picked up that whole season. So I continued to work out. Me and Pepper we worked out pretty much every day for a, a whole six months, <laughs> you know. Uh, then, you know, come the springtime, uh, had no idea what was going to happen, Otis. And and my mailman came. Hold on. Wait, wait. I don't want you to get into okay. that. Before okay. you start that, let me read this. Okay. A legendary mentor, a Galveston African youth coach by the name of Bernard W. Curtis, junior coach, Little League in Galveston for 18 years. He encouraged teamwork, hard work, above all else, discipline and respect. Now, go ahead and finish what you're saying. So tell us about this gentleman right here. <laughs> you got a picture of him, man. Yeah. So, uh, man, it was, he was about to came by the house one day. He, they say, man, he said, I can't believe you're not in the NFL. I said, I can't believe you. He said, man, if I get you in contact with this guy in Kansas City, would you be willing to go out there? I just kind of looked at him like, okay, whatever. You know what I mean? I didn't, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, this dude tripping, man. <laughs> like, you know, hey, two weeks later, I get that phone call. And, um, again, the rest is history. I signed with the Kansas City Chiefs and played 10 years with him. So, uh, that is, I mean, like, he's in my Hall of Fame speech. He's, you know, the guy that, that got opportunity for me, wow. made it possible. Like I say, sitting out a whole year with the agents or the top agents I had uh, had uh, was supposed supposed to be the way in, but you never know. Like I say, that goes back to how God has been so good to me because He worked in a mysterious way, and then to have your mailman come by and just have that conversation with you. And ironically, the the more to that story too is. Um, he had a relationship with this guy. The guy 
Mark Hadley, who had recruited me out of uh, Texas A&M, he was a scout for the Chiefs. And like I said, so they, it was familiar with me. And they and he's from Texas, so they knew each other. So he called Mark, and and that's how I got up there, man. It was just, so you just never know. Just never know what where, where your blessings coming from. You never know what can happen. So, because at the time I had didn't have a clue. Man, at that time it was like April, and we was you know the draft was about to happen again or something. And next day, you know, I get that phone. I talk to him and get that phone call. So that was great. Well, now we're gonna get in. We're going into the NFL. And big shouts out to um, Coach Curtis for doing that. Coach Rusty, aka Rusty. And RIP to you. He we did lose a, a great mentor and a great coach as well as a father. And I know Mr. Anders really appreciate that. And like he said, he's going to be in this Hall of Spain um speech, which is a great and a huge deal and a, a huge honor for his family as well as his kids and grandkids. Now, in 1999, which I had um the pleasure of being at this game, but the outcome wasn't a great one, but it did make you and turn you into a better person. And this was put in one of the Kansas City newspaper as well as in the Washington Post, people, the Washington Post. Anders, a former Pro Bowl fullback, was converted this year to halfback. If you didn't know that, Mr. Anders also (laughs) played halfback or tailback for the Kansas City Chiefs and carried 22 times for 142 yards in a Sunday game that they did win, 26 to 10. You remember who that team was? Uh, the the Broncos. Yes, sir. Against the Denver Broncos. Now, this was the biggest day by Kansas City running back since 1991. Eight years before that, Kimball is the only running back that put up these type of stats. (laughs) But the the unknown happened, which we didn't expect to happen, because I told him when they told him he was going to running back, that it's a possible, and I don't know if you remember this. We were sitting in your living room, and I say, you know what, um, it's a possibility you can be the first back to go to the Pro Bowl as a fullback and tailback. Yeah. But unfortunately, he ruptured his Achilles tendon. Yeah. Now, when that happened, what was going through your mind? Did you think your career was over? Did you think you can come back and have another stellar career at tailback, or they was going to move you back to um, fullback, or they was going to let you go? Well, so at that particular time, uh, I was very concerned about what type of injury it was. I've never, I didn't experience no pain or nothing. Just something that just happened. And I was trying to recover from that. And I made my, I put my best effort to make sure I was fully healthy when I got back. And I came back healthy. But unfortunately, it, it, it didn't turn out that way, it, you know, because they was, I mean, I was 33 years old at the time. So, you know, going to my 10th year, again, this this where the politics come in that, you know, they was they went on was going to move forward with somebody that was younger. And uh, so I came back the next year and played some, but not much. And it's funny, too, because, again, I'm I'm back in a situation now where I was on still on special team. And actually, uh, the coach, uh, one of my good friends, the coach, uh, I can't think of his name now, but special team coach. He asked me would I be willing to return some kicks and stuff or whatever. And I'm like, I'm still playing. It don't matter. You know what I mean? Because at the time, I wasn't getting much playing time, you know, coming back in my 10th year besides that game when uh, somebody got hurt. And that's against the Rams that year. And you know, you know what happened? They, nobody got hurt. So I kind of worked my way to playing a game and, 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 and that game, I rushed for uh, oh, like three touchdowns and 140, 57 yards against the Rams at that, that, that game. And then, so we went on the losing streak about four or five games. And then that's when they stopped playing it because we had no no opportunity to go to the playoffs and stuff. And they won't start looking at some younger running backs. And that was, you know, that's a business decision. That's something I think that uh, the NFL does a lot. And that's part of the game. It's really just not football. So that's some of the, the politics that comes in place when, when things like that happen. Um, so at the same time, I, I was, you know, again, pretty upset about it. But at the same time, you can control what you can control. And, that's, and I always say that, it's just be the best you. Give them the best you all the time. And, you know, if they don't accept that, then oh well. 
and uh, Mr. Benjamin wanted to put against that against the Denver Broncos in that game. He had them stats in the first half, people. He ain't even played yeah, that was the, the first entire half. game. So he probably would have went for 200 yards like Mr. Benjamin also posted. Um, he was on his way of rushing for 200-plus yards, and we would have seen a lot more of this coming because, again, in high school he was a running back. In college he was um, a running back, a receiver, which when they came into the run and shoot, they call it the super back at that time. And some other things that uh, um, some people probably don't know, Kimball had two games where he went over 100 yards on October the 22nd of 2000 versus St. Louis Rams, who was also Super Bowl champions. He had 102 yards. On September the 18th of 1999, that was against um, Denver. He went for 142 yards. Mr. Anders also had 10 games over 50 receiving yards. A lot of receivers not doing that to this day. Um, The first game was over 100 yards, which he recorded on December the 30th of 1999 versus the Miami Dolphins. He had 103 yards. The second game, he went over 90 yards of receiving, and that was on December the 4th of 1996 versus my Indianapolis Colts. And he had uh, a 96-yard game on September the 20th of 1997 versus the Carolina Panthers, in which he went for 90 four yards and these are receiving yards <laughs> which you can see uh, he developed that at university of houston as an inside receiver so he always had the hands those are some stats that you probably didn't know like i said i had to do this uh, research because i wanted to make sure that this show was a good show because i'm hosting it and anytime you're doing a show on a future hall of famer or anybody of importance you want to make sure you're getting the things right for they show that they can always go back and look look back on Pretty sure you're gonna find some mistakes. I know you're gonna critique me no. about this show, but but that's no, fine. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I just want I just want you to finish it because you got the total numbers on the. Whole oh, yeah, I got thing. I have I have all of that, Mister Anthony. I, just want to make sure you're, I, got, I have sure, all of that. Hey, you did you did a you did your homework. You did I, I did my job. homework because some of those so, things I don't know, but now that you just make names for stuff, I didn't I do not know. So See, I'm getting good. some rounded points. Can we go back to that 38K or are we still away from that? <laughs> are we, we, we still away? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Man, you, you got some good stats. Look at you. You did some real yeah, work. Yeah, I, I did do that. Now, let's get into the athletic director and the head coach, Kimball Anders. For a lot of you all who don't know, he had a, a very stellar, stellar, um, stellar career. Um, he was an athletic director as well as a coach. He coached at Fort Osage High School. He coached at Avila University um, as a as a football coach. He co- coached at my alma mater, one of my alma maters, at Mid America Nazarene University. He also was the head coach at Central High School. Also, the head coach at Northeast High School in Kansas City, Missouri. He was the athletic director of the Kansas City, Missouri school district from 2009 to 2013. He was the ball high head coach as well as the athletic director from 2013 to 2019, also was the Honda Coach of the Week in his term at Galveston Ball High School, did his internship with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, totaling nine years as a head coach, four years as a collegiate coach, and 10 years as a high school coach and high school school head coach and an athletic director. Those are some phenomenal numbers so if anybody questioning his <laughs> coaching and being an athletic director you can't the numbers don't what they say numbers never lie, lie. the lie. numbers never lie so with that being said congratulations to you on that um coach anders and last but not least going into the chiefs hall of fame my question to you how important that is to you being a part of history in the Kansas City Chiefs organization as well as around the NFL because they would know about it as well. And having a mural in the stadium that you questioned myself and Coach Anders, I mean, Mr. Edward Benjamin, about when we saw this mural. Yes, Mr. Anders have over a total of three murals in the Kansas City Chiefs stadium, which he didn't have no idea about. And these ain't come about just because he's getting voted into the Chiefs Hall of Fame. These murals was in the stadium when he was a player of the Kansas City Chiefs. So how important it is um, to you, Mr. Anders, in going into the Chiefs' ring of fame? I tell you what, man, it, it is it is definitely a blessing and definitely something that, um, like I say, man, it's history. 
it's something that's gonna be there forever. I mean, my grandkids, my kids' grandkids, it's gonna be on forever. And that's that that speaks volume of all the stuff you shared from the beginning all the way up, uh, from my childhood up until my adulthood, up until now, since I'm in my fifties, mid fifties, and to be able to to see that and be present and be uh, in that in that name because. At the end of the day, I say you plan for two things. Uh, when you plan for any sport, you plan for a championship, and some are playing for the Hall of Fame. Uh, my goal was never like I was playing for the Hall of Fame, but that's a that's an accolade that that that's is so high on the list because, like I say, you you plan for a Super Bowl ring. That's all. Everybody wants a championship. And I hope that's everybody' goal. You want to win a championship. And then to have your name put in the, the Hall of Fame, Ring of Fame, or any honor, fame is great. The the, the accolades of the All Pros and the, all the other things are great. But the the, the 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 highest pinnacle of all of that is the Ring of Fame or at a, at your organization at a Hall of Fame in Canton. And those are things that uh, speaks for itself. And 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 if you if you get opportunity. To, to make it at that on that peak or that ladder, that to me you did one hell of a job. So I'm I'm very thankful that I'm getting recognized. And like you said, the 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 kind of low key statistics that I'm not even uh, fully abreast to that has been a lot to others um, if they really look at it. And um, but it's just it's just, I feel great. It's awesome, man. I'm I'm very just honored and thankful. And um, you know. And it's just one of those things that I can kind of rest a little at ease right now that I'm, I got opportunity to just be considered to say I'm a Hall of Famer. You know what I mean? So I got a little different, might have a little different swagger now. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that that you do. Well, with, with closing, man, I want to say I really appreciate you coming on the show. And to close out, I want everybody to know that Mr. Anders played for the Kansas City Chiefs for 10 years. His first start came in 1992. He played in three Pro Bowls back-to-back, -back, and this is something that is hard to do in the NFL, which was in 1995, 1996, and 1997. He accumulated 2,261 career rushing yards on 495 carries and nine touchdowns. Now, that he didn't stop there. He also had 369 receptions. For 2,000, and again, more reception yards than rushing yards, which I don't understand, for 2,829 yeah. yards with nine reception touchdowns. And that day and time, you know how tight ends saying, I want to get paid receivers money. Just imagine if he was able to say that and get paid receivers money, um, which is the most by a fullback or a running back. He once was a running back, but he had all of these total yards and receptions more than any fullback to come through the Kansas City Chiefs organization, as well as a running back by the Kansas City Chiefs organization. That's a feat within itself, Mr. Anders, man. We are so proud of you. Congratulations. We can't give enough round of applause for the accomplishments that you have made and that you have set in stone in the Kansas City Chiefs organization. Your name will be forever heard within the stadium or seen in the stadium all with the murals unless they bring that stadium down. But guess what? If they rebuild, it yeah, goes rebuild. right back up for <laughs> others to see. It just will not yeah. be that original stadium. Right. Also, Kimball Anders also won the Unsung Hero Award, and they still present that award right now in the high schools, which he presented when he was the athletic director of the Kansas City, Missouri um, school system at Northeast High School, I believe. Is that correct? correct. At Northeast High School. So big shouts out to Northeast High School with that award, as well as employing Mr. Um, Anders when he was into coaching. Are we going to get back into coaching? Is that something you're looking into on the yeah, high school level, collegiate level? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I like to get back into coaching. And, again, get try, like I say, right now, I'm focusing on right now getting back and giving to the community and setting my foundation up, you know, and, and get my put myself in position to be around kids and try to help them through some things in life and, and be a positive impact. Uh, down here in Texas right now, and and just showing some kids some different things about life, and being being a mentor, you know that's that's my lifelong dream right now. Okay, well before we close out, Kim will do have some things upcoming um, events coming up, 
And um, as we know, Kimball Anders will be um, inducted into the Chiefs, soon to be a Hall of Fame inducted into the Chiefs Hall of Fame. That will be on November the 6th of 2022 when the Kansas City Chiefs face the Tennessee Titans, correct? Correct. When they face the Tennessee um, Titans. And Kimball Anders has um, a youth program coming up, which is the Children's Poetry and Illustration. I'm going to put that flyer up. The Children's Youth and Illustration. That will be at Rock County Recreation Center at 718 41st Street in, in Galveston, Texas. If you need information on that event, you can um, call 489-354-2788 for information. He also have events coming up for adults as well. This children's event is on Saturday, October the 15th. Tomorrow, October the 14th, he will have um, a Hall of Fame celebration party that will be held at Club 68 in Galveston, Texas. Um, I don't have the address to that, but you can look up Club 68 in Galveston, Texas. Then he will have the children's event October the 15th in Galveston, Texas. That start at 2 o'clock from 2 to 4. Yes. From 2 to, two to, four, two two to, to 5. 5 p.m. So be sure um, you tune in to that. These will also be posted on my National Scouting Service Facebook page as well as on Instagram and on Twitter under National Scouting and National Scouting Service on Facebook and um, on Instagram. Also, he will have an after party after the children's event at the spot, which is located in Galveston, Texas. So please come out um, to say hello to Mr. Anders. And I'm just throwing this out there. Get your autographs while you can, because once he becomes that Hall of Famer, Everything comes with a price. He played the price of being a professional, a respected professional, and going into the Hall of Fame as well as being an all-pro and going to three Pro Bowls. With that being said, Mr. Anders, man, we really appreciate you on the show. Is it anything that you would like to say and add or any shots out you would like to give? No, nah, man, I'm just, like I say, I give a shout-out to yourself, man, for, for being, you know, what you're doing right now today. I appreciate everything you've done for me and the community, and I appreciate you know, just the way you are, man. You know, I watch you growing up as a young kid and and we're sitting here today and, and being able to enjoy each other, each other and share these moments and share our history and, and, and teach these young kids about, um, you know, morals and values and something that, that's on our list. So I'm, I'm thankful for you guys, uh, the people that supported me over the years and, and to my family and my kids, man, uh, without, without them, um, uh, I don't know where I'll be doing right now. You know what I mean? So well, with that, hey, I'm, yeah, I'm just blessed, man. Hey, big shouts out to the family. I got to get ready to get off because I have a class that I have to take. My And for y'all that don't know, Mr. Anders is my uncle. He's been telling me to go back to school, go back to school. And now I finally done it with the um, support of my wife as well. I already obtained my associate's degree. Now I'm working on getting my bachelor's. So I'd like to thank you, um, Coach Anders, Uncle Kimball, as well as as my wife and a lot of y'all that probably didn't know too i used to be over um mr andrews public relations under his running back giving back organization and he used to always tell me because i kind of had a gift of helping kids and helping kids get in school through sports that i don't always have to be under his umbrella i need to get out and start my own and that's why i started national scouting service so that's a big up to you um as well and before we get off the show i have an ending video in um, respect and to the honor of my uncle going into the Hall of Fame. Thanks for everybody yeah. that tuned in <laughs> with their questions and stuff like that. He's laughing because he all he always don't know, know what, what I'm up got. to. I always yeah, got my sleep. <laughs> but with that got. being said, man, we hope y'all enjoyed the show. Mr. Anders, thank you very much. This show is brought to you on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Station Head, TikTok, and YouTube. If you want to reach out to us, I'm coming to the show. High school athletes, coaches, or uh, um players or whatnot, you can email us at national scouting service at yahoo.com or at national scouting service at gmail.com. With that being said, I'm just to bring this video up. We're going to close out with this video. I'm going to hide myself from Mr. One of the fun parts about today, one of the best parts about today is the opportunity to get to announce the newest member of the Chiefs Hall of Fame. Today is my pleasure to welcome Kimball Anders into the Chiefs Hall of Fame. Kimball played for the Chiefs for 10 years, 
teams he played on made the playoffs six times. He was a three-time Pro Bowler. Over his career, he played in 125 games for the Chiefs, collecting over 5,000 yards in total offense. And he did about half of it running the ball and half of it catching the ball, and he's in the top 15 in both categories all the time for the Chiefs. In addition to being an incredible player, he's also an amazing man. Since he retired from football, he's founded a nonprofit to help children with healthy lifestyles. He's served as a head football coach and an athletic director for over two decades, and now he's part of the Kansas City Ambassadors, and he's a true treasure of the city of Kansas City. Please join me in welcoming Kimball Anders into the Chiefs Hall of Fame. The run to Kimball Anders. And sweep left, 35-30 in the open field. Can outrace everybody in the end zone. Touchdown, Kimball Anders. 